Hello, everybody, and welcome to another wonderful evening of readings with the Windfall Reading Series. We've got some wonderful readers tonight and some fantastic announcements. My name is Wendy Beck, and I work at the Eugene Public Library, and I'm really excited to be a part of this, this reading series. It's always delightful, and we're so glad you're here. Before we start, and before I introduce Henry Alley of the Lane Literary Guild, I've got just a couple really quick thank yous and a quick announcement. Um, so first, I want to thank the Lane Literary Guild. Without them, we would not be here. This is They are a fantastic group. They um, offer plenty of programs and support for local authors and authors in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, it's just a fantastic group of people, and um, we're so grateful that we can um, co-partner on this reading series with them. I also wanted to thank the Eugene Public Library, specifically the Friends of the Eugene Public Library. They are tireless fundraisers and advocates for all things library-related and community-related. Um, they do the book sales, they do different events, and they uh, support us in ways that enrich the library and the community. So many thanks to the Friends of the Eugene Public Library for all of their work and all their passionate advocacy for libraries. So with that in mind, I wanted to let you know that there are a couple different ways that you can make comments or offer questions to the authors and to the group as a whole. One is you can leave your comments if you'd like right below where we are live streaming on YouTube. And you can um, offer your comments and questions there if you'd like, there will be a QA and a at the end. Um, if you're feeling a little shy or you don't uh, belong to YouTube in a way that you can leave questions or comments, you are more than welcome to email me. And let me show you my email address. That should also be in the chats and comments um, below YouTube. But please drop me an email and you're welcome to use your name, a pen name, something really fanciful if you'd like, and I will read your question at the end. So that's another way that you can leave your comments or questions. All right, so I'll hide this for now. And without further ado, let me bring Henry Alley to the fore. Hello, Henry. Hello, Wendy. Thanks again. You're welcome. For all the support the library provides for the Lane Literary Guild. And um, I'm here tonight to introduce two wonderful poets. And, but before I do, I wanted to give an overview of the Lane Literary Guild, which, which got its start uh, back in 1984. And it was founded by Bill Swede and by Ingrid Wendt. And I had the privilege of being one of the people that witnessed this founding. And uh, since that time, they have been an active force for literary endeavor in the Lane County and the wider Pacific Northwest area. We launched a group of readings back in 1984, which began with William Stafford, who was a personal friend, actually, of Bill Sweet. And uh, over the years, uh, the readings have, have had a force throughout our community. Also, the Lane Literary Guild advanced critique groups, which are still live and well in fiction, nonfiction, and poetry. So we invite you to investigate what the Lane Literary Guild could provide for you. Throughout this time period, or actually a little bit later in the time period, in the 1990s, we started the Windfall series, which paired up uh, two distinguished writers in the Lane County or Northwest area. And we have been doing that more or less consistently ever since. Tonight, we have the privilege of introducing two people whose work has been featured in the Pacific Northwest Poetry Series. And in fact, this will be a book launch for Nance Van Winkle's new, new collection. And we thought it would be particularly apt that one of our uh, former readers in the Windfall series, Christopher Howell, who is director of Lynx House Press, which will be being putting out uh, Nance's book, that he tell you a little bit about the series before we actually introduce our two readers, John Witte and Nance Van Winkle. So, Christopher, uh, could we hear from you for a little bit about the Pacific Northwest Poetry Series? Okay. Thanks a lot, Henry. Under the editorship of MacArthur-winning poet Linda Beards, the Pacific Northwest Poetry Series was launched 
in 2001 with the University of Washington Press publication of For the Century's End by longtime Alaska resident John Haynes. It was a fitting beginning for a series born of the recognition that there existed a distinctive voice and body of concern in the poetry that, from the days of Theodore Retke and before, had been emerging from the Northwest region. Each of the 21 series volumes issued by the University of Washington Press has reinforced this notion and revealed its source to be an interplay between geography and language distinct from regionalism per se, since the writing does not address the region so much as proceed from it. The voice in these poems tends to be intimate, meditative, lyrical, and direct. And what it lacks demonstrably in book after book is the cynicism about both language and living prevalent in much contemporary writing generally. With the current volume, the publication of Pacific Northwest Poetry Series titles shifts from the University of Washington Press to Lynx House Press, an independent nonprofit literary publisher based in Spokane, Washington. But the series will continue to operate under the brilliant editorship of Linda Beards and to produce new titles at the rate of one each year. Nance Van Winkle's The Many Beds of Moth or Washington is therefore both a continuation and a beginning. We believe that the Pacific Northwest Poetry Series is an ongoing invitation to engage with a literary culture which, while not restricted to the region, is an example and a reminder of the cultural richness of the region. Therefore, it seems to us the publication of each new volume should be broadly share, a broadly shared event in which schools colleges, libraries, and community groups throughout the five Northwest states should be participants and beneficiaries. Lynx House Press has and will remain supplying the human resources to accomplish this goal. But financial donations in support of our efforts will always be most welcome. Lynx House Press was founded in 1975, which makes it one of the oldest still functioning independent literary presses in the United States. We have issued more than 200 titles, more than 172 of them poetry titles. Some of the poets included include Yusef Komunyaka, Patricia Goetheke, Gillian Connolly, Vern Rutsala, Margaret Robeson, Carlos Reyes, Christopher Buckley, Madeline DeFries, Ignacio Ruiz Perez, Tom Wayman, Linda Gregerson, and Peter Sears. Lynx House writers have been recipients of many awards, including the Kingsley Tufts Award, the San Francisco Book Award, the Pulitzer Prize, the American Book Award, the National Book Critics Circle Award, and many, many others. Lynx House has sought always to publish work of outstanding verbal intensity, aesthetic merit, and social engagement. We are pleased that Linda Beard's vision concurs so beautifully with our own and look forward to a fruitful and years-long collaboration. We are also enormously pleased and honored to have published Nance Van Winkle's magnificent new volume, The Many Beds of Martha Washington, and we wish to thank the Windfall Poetry Series for sponsoring tonight's event, which includes also Eugene's own John Whitty, who has himself published two collections in the Pacific Northwest Poetry Series. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christopher. You know, Christopher is one of our heroes of the small press publishing, which I still feel is a part, and actually is the center of of the literary activity in this country, the marvelous activity that goes on and the people that are recognized. So thank you again, Christopher. So as I said tonight, we're featuring two people in this wonderful series, uh, Nance Van Winkle and John Witte. And uh, our first reader is John Witte. Uh, I've been privileged to know John for a number of years. John's poems have appeared widely in publications such as The New Yorker, Paris Review, Kenyon Review, and American Poetry Review. 
and been included in the Norton Introduction to Literature, <clears throat> among several anthologies. He is the author of Loving the Days, Wesleyan University Press, 1978, The Hurdling, uh, Orkizy, I guess it's Orkizy's Press, 2005, Second Nature, University of Washington Press, 2008, and Disquiet, University of Washington Press, 2015. For 30 years, he was the editor of Northwest Review, as well as numerous books, including The Collected Poems of Hazel Hall, Oregon State University Press, 2000. He's the recipient of two writing fellowships from the NEA, a residency at the Provincetown Fine Arts Work Center, and numerous other grants and awards. He lives with his family in Eugene, Oregon, where he taught until recently at the University of Oregon. And I, I want to say also um, how I, in reading uh, John's poetry, how I feel like he holds each word up for us to see. And he frequently puts a lot of space around his words. So we really think about a word in a, in a new way. And I just wanted to uh, read just a few lines from his poem um, about his neighbor's truck. Says, I shall now praise my neighbor's truck crouched on its slab black and metallic candy apple red emblazoned with chevrons and swashes of gold his only chariot why shouldn't he treasure it glistening like unto the color of beryl that mirrored the grill work and fog lights on the roof the little trumpets of annunciation the leaping trout and bull elk the eagle airbrushed wheeling over a mountain lake and that's another Typical in the sense that he can just kind of sketch out a scene in just a single gesture. So, uh, my pleasure to introduce John Witte. Thank you, Hank. Um, I had forgotten about that poem. Um, it's uh, amusing <laughs> and 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 vivid. I remember that truck. That was my neighbor's truck, um, and he adored it. Um, so, thank you to the Windfall Reading Series for including me. Um, thanks to Wendy and, and the Eugene Public Library uh, for sponsoring these readings. It's a special pleasure to be reading with Nance Van Winkle, whose wonderful new collection, uh, as Hank mentioned, as Chris mentioned, um, is just out. And, um, and uh, the latest in the Poets of the Northwest series. Um, I'll be reading tonight from a collection called Wolf Notes. And these are poems celebrating nature and warning of its destruction. There are a number at the heart of this book are a number of biographical poems, um, uh, including one about uh, Greta um, that begins with her first words addressing the United Nations and this is a quote, my name is Greta Thunberg and I want you to panic. Another of these poems about Tim de Christopher uh, ends with his words written from prison. And again, quote, the closer we get to the point of no return, the less we'll have to lose by fighting back. Which brings me to the long poem I'll read tonight called K and Inquest about Theodore Kaczynski, the so-called Unabomber. I try to convey in this poem the wrenching ambivalence that I feel um, regarding Kaczynski, being at once appalled by his methods, yet finding him otherwise brilliant and relevant. One of the challenges of reading this allowed is that you don't have the benefit of a lot of uh, typographical uh, signal signals in the poem. Um, starting with its basic form of um, these kind of jarring uh, um, offset lines. And this is something you can't do live. Can you, but can you see that? See that at the there we go. So uh, the poem actually ref references this in the in the opening um, that uh, that this um, 
these lines capture, try to capture some of the uh, intense um, uh, ambivalence that we feel, many of us feel about Kaczynski. Moreover, in the poem, let's see, his words are in italic, um, which you won't be able to see, but I will try to convey this with my voice. Some of the material quoted uh, is from Joseph Conrad's The Secret Agent. And as much as we all hate air quotes, uh, I'm gonna have to go like this and, and try to signal when, when we're quoting from there. And, and uh, in one case, um, the um, FBI's uh, redaction of names uh, is replicated in the poem. Just to give you an idea of the commotion going on. Let's see. See it there? That's how it appears in the document itself. I chose this poem um, in light of the recent catastrophic failure of the uh, climate talks in Glasgow. Uh, my intent in the poem is to create a, a sort of maelstrom of language that breaks over the listener. So this will take about 15 minutes. K, an inquest. Inspiration and expiration. Savant or psycho, what are you saying to us, Fyodor Kaczynski, apostle of the Church of Boom, or just another angry inmate with a number, pacing, pecking out letters, essays, parables, dropping your leaves, feverishly writing, writing, writing. I can't sleep. Crazed, surely, or working in mysterious ways, we just don't know about you, leaving us with these jarring back and forth feelings. If loopy, for example, then how so suasive? Are you cyclothymic, endomorphic? Or are you the future, even the near future, prophetically speaking, what we cannot allow ourselves to hear? The world will not be here for us much longer. Is that where we're going on this highway of progress? And where? what are we supposed to do about it? Anyway, you were never much for metaphors, preferring the precise, lifeless certainties of stats and facts, the terrifying, admitted, thrilling, quote, era demonstratum of your nerdy screeds, imploring us to love the wilderness. Our lives exploded fragments. Theodore Kaczynski, may I call you K? We will conduct this inquest in a form conveying the push and pull of our ambivalence, gathering up and reassembling these pieces of your life, conveying our contempt and nasty hunch. You may be right. Exhibit A. The burst of light and shrapnel, your first nail and splinter loaded bomb made of junk from the dump, carefully fitted, filed and sanded, pipe fishing line tape, the pieces meticulously assembled and reassembled. Your first trigger a nail held by rubber bands, released when the package was open, striking match heads, the charge ignited by the victim. You leave clues to throw them off, the initials FC for Freedom Club, not fuck computers or fuck civilization. Your male bombs blossoming in sophistication, power, and humor. A package addressed to Percy Wood, president of American Airlines. The device hidden in a hollowed out book published by Arbor House inside a handmade wooden box. Your thing for wood and woods. Who in hell do you think you are, Theodore Kaczynski? We've barely begun and already we're sick of you, recoiling from our touch, a trophy child retreating into the cool chambers of theoretical mathematics. It's all a game. Your IQ off the charts, able to solve the unsolvable problem. So why, if you're nothing but a pinheaded professor publishing your proofs, can't we stop thinking of you? Kaczynski, shut up, shut up, go away, or come closer, hunched over, typing, read my manifesto. It's all in the manifesto, composed 
in the first person plural, how many of you are there? The Industrial Revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for the human race. Yeah, well, we've heard this before. When an individual doesn't fit into the system, it causes problems for the system. Abios tuberosa, the American groundnut you live on in the wilderness, taken as one of your pseudonyms when you travel to mail or deliver your packages, another being Conrad, recalling The Secret Agent, a book you must have read a dozen times as a child, its main character exuding an air of infathomable indifference known only by the nickname of Professor. The old terrorist raising an uncertain and claw-like hand gave a swaggering tilt to the black felt sombrero shading the hollows and ridges of his wasted face. Brainy, brooding, withdrawn, you floor your teachers, skipping grades, finding girls impossible to solve. You disappear into your messy makeshift lab, contriving gadgets of wood, wire, tape, lenses, gears, wheels, etc. Composing trios for your father on piano, your brother trumpet, and you on trombone, your eerie dissonant shutdowns accompanied by rage and anime, personal disorientation, anxiety, and social isolation. You solve Laplace transforms at 16, changing a function of time into a function of complex frequency. Exhibit B, the following components were removed from the blast scene, remnants of one inch pipe, wooden box, screws, nails, rubber bands, epoxy, wood plugs, black plastic tape, brown wrapping paper, Eugene O'Neill US postage stamps. What are you, crazy? Bombs? You were such a quiet boy, and now look at you everywhere in the news, our madman du jour. And yet we sense, is this what scares us? A desperate sort of, dare we say it, logic? But you're off your hinges, Kaczynski. Go back to prison, leave us alone, let us sleep. Depression at Harvard, acute sexual starvation, typical undergrad. You take solace in your prizes and accolades. No free love for you, no moral ambiguity. You're either right or wrong. You make a good impression, attractive, relaxed, talks easily, exceedingly stable, well-integrated, maybe slightly shy. What was new was the fact I felt I could kill someone. He is reflective, sensitive, and conscious of his responsibility to society. At first, it seemed eerie and strange to go alone into the mountains, away from all roads and paths. You were alone in the wilderness of your rage, inventing some gods such as Grandfather Rabbit. You lose yourself in the forest, waking up to find they had put a road through the middle of it. I returned home as quickly as I could. I, have something, I had something to do. They are bound to make me out to be a sicky, wee, sick, think it can be stopped, and we will give here some indication of how to go about stopping it. The world is mediocre, limp, without force. Madness and despair are a force. Madness and despair. Give me these for a lever, and I'll move the world. Something. What was it drove you over the edge? We keep looking for the trigger. You were hospitalized as an infant, strapped down, terrified. I told you, they bulldozed a road through the forest. Or later in college, when you volunteered for an experiment, submitting to vehement, sweeping, and personally abusive attacks on your values, they destroyed the spring. Or the lonely nights in graduate school, your thesis on geometric function theory, a function P, E, defined on a unit circle, is a boundary for a function F, C, defined in the unit disk. Maybe 10 or 12 people in the country understood or appreciated it. Professor K, you mumbled in class, becoming increasingly nervous. F, Z has the limit P, E, at E, along some curve lying in the unit disk and having an endpoint at E. Exhibit C, the following components were removed from the blast scene. 
Remnants of one-inch pipe, anti-open wire, loop switch, smokeless, powder, C-cell battery, filament, white tape, insulated duplex, wire, solder, screws, tacks, nails. Narcissistic personality disorder? Paranoid schizophrenic? Or just a strange bird? We've caught you now. Stop rattling your bars. The technophiles are taking us on an utterly reckless ride into the unknown. We don't want to think about you or the planet warming, the oceans rising around us, the animals. Where are the animals? On second thought, don't leave us, Kaczynski. Come back, quicken us. The system will probably collapse when the weight of human suffering becomes unbearable. We need to believe you are deranged, especially your brother blowing your cover, finding in your manifesto the same rambling delusional themes as in your letters, the same phrases popping up, cool-headed logicians, and you can't eat your cake and have it too. You have nobody to blame but yourself hungering for publication. The decisions necessary to keep the system running will be so complex that human beings will be incapable of making them. Your refusal to accept your disease presented as evidence of your illness. The machines will be an effective control. We will be so dependent on them that turning them off would amount to suicide. What are we to say of an act of destructive ferocity so absurd as to be incomprehensible, in fact mad? It would be really telling if one could throw a bomb into pure mathematics. We can do anything we like as long as it is unimportant. He focuses his writings on fleeting attempts to relate to females, the FBI sniffing at your crevices. For example, the relationship with when he was 17, at 32, Miss Z in graduate school, and when he was 36, we propose the defense of nature. We believe that primitive man was better satisfied by his way of life. Acquiring powdered aluminum and magnesium, powdered zinc, sulfur, potassium nitrate, potassium permanganate, it may be that revolutionaries, by hastening the breakdown, will be reducing the extent of the disaster. Mr. Kaczynski describes these thoughts going through his head in the time it took to walk one block. Violence is never the right way, but sometimes it is the only way that probable cause exists, that the following items, which are the fruits and instrumentalities of the foregoing crimes, are currently stored at the premises of Theodore John Kaczynski. Real people, though you did not know them. Hugh Scrutton, Thomas Moser, and Gilbert Murray killed, and 23 others injured, lost fingers and hands, burns to face and body, deafening, blinding. Exhibit D, the following components were removed from the blast scene. Three quarter inch aluminum pipe fragments, improvised metal wood flip switch steel collars, quarter inch diameter metal pins, four nine volt batteries, ring shank nails, screws, sodium chloride, aluminum residue, green insulated multi-strand wire, America's light fueled by truth and reason US postage stamps. Get out of our lives, Kaczynski, and take your hopeless vision of pristine nature with you. Take the anonymous, torn body parts. Do not pass go. Drop dead, Kaczynski. Die. Try. The woods around your cabin, crawling with agents, dressed as lumberjacks and mailmen. You have a new address now, a new name, number 04475-046 in a new despair, within months of TV docudrama, Unabomber, the true story, featuring Robert Hayes as your brother David, and Tobin Bell as you, firing your lawyers, building their case for insanity, even your cabin seized as evidence and reassembled for display at the museum in Washington, DC. You have visitors in prison. He laughs easily and often, affable, polite, and sincere. You use your underwear to try to hang yourself. David gives his $1 million reward to the families of those you attack. 
and your belongings are auctioned to the highest bidder. Your typewriter, $22,003. Your draft manifesto, $20,053. Your hoodie and sunglasses, $20,025. And your handwritten autobiography, $17,780. Along with tools and clothes, several hundred books, and 40,000 journal pages, writing, writing, writing. What frightens me is that as the years go by, I may begin to lose my memories of the mountains and the woods. The chief inspector's eyes searched the gruesome detail of that keep of mixed things. He picked up the legs first, one after the other. He was that scattered, you didn't know where to begin. My occupation now, I suppose, is jail inmate, pacing, writing, reading Chesterton. Imagination does not breed insanity. Poets do not go mad. Mathematicians go mad. On good days, happiness is something you have right now. And on bad, I believe in nothing. Your ideas, nothing if not familiar. Take Mumford. Western man has exhausted the dream of mechanical power, which so long dominated his imagination. What's new is the ruined world. It would be good to get as many children as possible introduced to the wilderness. Exhibit E. The following components were removed from the blast scene. Wooden box, wooden chalk, wooden wafer, fragments of 15, 16 inch galvanized pipe, black insulated duplex stranded wire, anti-lift switch and toggle switch, four D cell batteries, six triple A cell batteries, black rubber, green paint, white putty, metal tag bearing the initials FC, glass tubes, tin juice can, lead, split shot, paper clips, sheet rock, nails, three penny common brass nails, wood screws, cardboard from bugle cereal box, razor blade, fragments, aluminum and magnesium residue, potassium chloride, barium sulfate residue. If I am successful at this, when I am caught, not alive, I fervently hope, there will be some speculation as to my motives. Sybil, schizo, apocalyptic Jeremiah thundering, have you not brought this on yourself? We've had enough of this manic poem seething with dire visions, especially the ones relentlessly coming to pass. Can it be you were right all along? Oh, K, don't leave us. Come back. I will not say it. I will not say boom, bloom, flower. It was a prayer in which I swore I would take revenge for what was being done to the forest. Placing the package, it's so light, in the mailbox, picked up and driven to the processing plant where the parcels are separated by shape and size, a postmark and fluorescent code sprayed on, read by an optical scanner, identifying the address of the victim sorted by zip code, loaded on a plane, drawing a line through the sky to its destination where it is fed through a barcode reader, then driven by truck, careful, careful, placed in the mail, carriers, satchel, and delivered by hand to its intended recipient. I have the means to make myself deadly. That's how it ends. Thank you, John. Appreciate that reading. A very extensive and very engaging from the standpoint of both character and image. So thank you again for the great reading. All right, Bef before I, um, I introduce uh, Nance Van Winkle, perhaps uh, Wendy, we could put on the screen a way of getting her book and uh, kind of a preview of coming attractions for the many beds of Martha Washington. And it's available from Link House Press. And you can also order previous titles um, at the uh, email address below. So lovely, uh, lovely cover. And we understand that Nance 
designed that herself. So thank you very much. All right. So it's my privilege now to move on to another uh, winner in the series, uh, the Pacific Northwest uh, Poets Series, Poetry Series, Nance Van Winkle. Uh, Nance Van Winkle's ninth poetry collection, which is this, The Many Beds of Martha Washington, appears and has appeared last month, uh, October 2021, with the Pacific Series. And she has also published a book of visual poems with Pleiades Press 2016 and five books of fiction, mostly recently Ever Yours, a novel in the form of a scrapbook from Twisted Roads Publications 2014. She's the recipient of two NEA fellowships, the Washington State Book Award, a Patterson Fiction Prize, Poetry Society of America's Gordon Barber Poetry Award, a Christopher Isherwood Fellowship, and three Pushcart Prizes, and she teaches in Vermont College's MFA program and lives in Spokane, Washington. And uh, I would just like to say uh, that her poetry, as I, I've read, what I've read, um, is full of kind of surprising juxtapositions that just kind of leap out. And um, I'm thinking of the metaphysical poets, especially uh, perhaps John Donne, um, and we have images from her, such as Ward of the Moon, um, Machine Humming in B-flat, and her poem, and her poem, very interesting poem, I Am My Own Assistant, we get a parallel uh, between her and uh, some kind of attending assistance that's going on that moves outside the, the persona of the poem. And there, we have this wonderful phrase, um, I am a dash off note with promises. So uh, without further ado, here is Nance Van Winkle reading from her new collection. Thank you so much, Hank. Really appreciate that. And oh my God, John, that poem, that was, that was a powerful, powerful poem. Um, very complicated feelings now about Mr. Kaczynski. So, okay, <laughs> I will say some more thank yous, but I'm going to jump right into a poem first to get us going. Um, I heard from a few former students that they might dip into this. So this is, this is a little poem about teaching. Um, I think that's what it's about. Um, and maybe teaching writing, uh, possibly poetry, the hardest thing to teach, maybe an impossible thing to teach. And this is called The Power May Be Restored. I'm asked to teach a second language while speaking in a third, and absolutely not is apparently an unacceptable reply. The requester flashes a demure smile. It might be hard at first, she says, but it'll get easier. We'd entered through a broken cellar door. Standing, shivering in the dank classroom feels like blinking awake in a tomb. And maybe, I think, taking the chalk she hands me, maybe that's exactly what's happened and where. Pretty, pretty, please, her lips pout. I don't know the second language, nor the third. Still, the chalk in my fingers takes so naturally to its old friend, the slate. Scritch, scratch, there appears my white answer, which we both bend and squint to read. A stark sentence, a glow, in the new alphabet. So yeah, I, I really want to say a couple other thank yous <clears throat> to um, definitely to Windfall for putting this all together and to Wendy for doing such an amazing job organizing us here with this technology. It's been great. And then, of course, 
Big thanks to Linda Beards, my wonderful editor um, at the series. I think this is the, the third book I've done with the series, and I just have a lot of gratitude that they've stuck with me. And then, of course, to Christopher Howell um, as he takes over as publisher for the series. I think we were all surprised that, um, including Chris, that mine was going to be, since Chris and I are old, old friends, that mine was going to be the first book out in, in the series. But thank you, Chris, and um, to Christine Holbert at, at the press, too, for putting that, um, making such a beautiful book for me. I appreciate it all. So I'm going to um, read next a poem I sort of think of as the voice that's often a occurring in these in these poems um oops. here we are um it's uh she's a tour guide and she's a tour guide to us to our world um maybe us as seen from some um, from some far-flung future time. And the title is, of course, um, what you all say to each other every time you take a tour with a tour guide. Who cares? The tour guide just makes it up as she goes along. Here we have a woman known to us only as Lady X. She worked most of her century to rid the world of high heels. Fearlessly, she ventured forth among the little dancing and circles dogs. She sent back the diamond studded dildos that arrive willy nilly in the mail. And once when a big truck claiming it could ride up over the fog wanted her to want it back, she said no. No to bug zappers, to elixirs believed back then to make one ageless. Notice her stitched in frown, that get ups called a wetsuit. We suspect she'd want it unto death, what she plunged head first towards in life, and hence our clever display. The ravaging river and this unidentifiable tree with the huge white birds. So speaking of students, um, thinking about um, that question I remember asking more than once, uh, why were you late for your exam? So this, this poem is a sort of list of the reasons. It's called, I had my reasons. The migraine made me lose track of time. The gut cramp had me on another line after the ill-advised trade of this tit for that tat, which got me stuck in the last millennium's traffic where Proust honked and peered and peeped, thus exacerbating the past life trauma of being ground, of being ground into a too white bread, baked into a dough, rejected and sent back to Ecclesiastes, where I was deemed not purely enough bread and consequently left off the ark, which is why I'm late and why I'm in no way and no how to blame. This poem follows it in the book. Proust. You need to rest, I tell volume three, laying it open, pages down on the arm of the couch. And from there is long sigh issues through me. Week in, week out, we've cleaved to one another. And now the consequences of all we've wrought upon the world gather in potent storm gust. Secrets 
face down secrets, each sorrow without a wisp of sorry in it, and no one here a stranger anymore to the end coming round as the wild willed out. <clears throat> This one's called My Gun. Just as I think, cripes, I'm scared and need a big dog and feel nearly done with it all, someone puts a gun in my hand. I hate it, but hold it for a minute anyway, recalling how I'd sworn never to wear my mother's mink but then she made me try it on. And oh, the warm, dense nest of it, and me as its snug little egg. I want to give back the gun, but my hand balks. It's already turned the barrel in the direction of a loathed street light, and my mind's already blown the bulb's brains out and is now assembling every speck of awfulness from my effing oeuvre, where the gun's aimed for the worst spots, which once I believed were the vital organs. The gun knows knows that it is in fact terribly sad, alone, and only ever loved badly. And sensing that now, the fearful, nearly done with it all, one lets the all fall away, hears herself tell herself to go on, drop the gun, and watches herself obey. Because B, your arrival admitted was up and out of the mud. So what? Here you are. One, four o'clock, you walk across the lake. It's ice creeks, gut syllables, lingo between fish and fowl. You'd refused the skates because A, surely then you'd have to perform a spin and B, they could hurt the ice. You, its executioner. You, the handle turning the blade. So I thought I'd read the poem out of which the, the title comes. <clears throat> Thank you all for being here, by the way. Martha Washington slept here. Between my future bed and any prior one of hers, sunups may appear as nosebleeds across the mountain's face. She, me, we watched as long as we could, then lay tucked beside our smooth talkers under bright duvets depicting flowery new centuries. She had her losses and kept mum. Horse's mane might be shorn or a swan's wings notched. Martha, you would be called Marty in 2018. You would have acrylic fingernails, tattooed eyebrows. You'd shun meats. I arrange a bouquet of fall leaves and golden grasses. Bless this vase that anchors our slow shared hour through a gale of years. Time to bank the fires, reset the silver for our latecomers. If the swans fly at all, they won't fly far. Dear mother of petticoats, sister of a suede glove, let our gravy boats pass in the hall. 
may my my house go on going up wherever yours come down. So I'll end with this um, little poem from my husband, Rick. It's called Still with our indoor voices. We step outside and greet the mountain we'd come so far to see. We were the people People Magazine had never heard of, sleeping on lawn chair cushions in the back of a truck, hushed by first light, as if we'd fled, had we a colony collapse? The no fire, the in love with how a rock cliff allows the mountain sheep to dance along its promontories. The lowlands with everyone we knew behind us. Our feet blue from the cold, but we have socks. Socks of a deeper, darker blue. I hold to you and you hold to me. We put on the socks. Thanks. Thanks so much, Nance, for the, for the vivid poetry that you wrote and that you read to us. And before we start the question and answers, uh, let's, if we can, have one more time the uh, the cover, uh, if we can, on the screen, along with how you can order this this new book um, in all of its marvelousness. So thank you very much again for such a great reading. And so now we are going to turn to questions and uh, perhaps we can all five of us appear uh, in the studio here when Wendy gets a chance to put us all together and also um, ask uh, Wendy if there have been any questions that have come up yet or shall we just launch into it? There is. There is a question from someone named Dana and they are asking John. They say, I listened wrapped to this poem which became, the more you read, an urgent address or appeal. I know of your long and passionate connection to the natural world, but when and how and what first sparked your interest in Theodore Kaczynski? <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Um, though that's a that's always a hard one, as you know, as a as a, a wonderful mm -hmm. writer yourself, um, ideas uh, gradually percolate up. Um, and, and, uh, so they're back there, down there, kind of at work, um, you know, living a kind of invisible life until they burst forth and, and there they are. And, and so I can't, I can't tell you exactly when that, that happened or why, um, um, the my reason for reading it, I, I know I'm repeating myself, but um, the the feeling enormous disappointment and for the uh, the tragic lack of of um, of agreement um, uh, by in the climate summit and um, just how deeply frustrating that is, and so it brought me back to Kaczynski and. And this feeling that I had um, um, once I got past, once once the horror of what he had inflicted on people, anonymous people for the most part, once that receded a bit, and and especially once I began to read his manifesto and his um, his, his other writings. Um, I, I began to see a much more complicated character and, and, and one whose own ambivalence about civilization and, and, and industry um, 
places him in, at the center, I guess, of my own thinking about the future. That lo and behold, there's uh, this monster, if you will, at the at the at the center of of what I think is the the future we are headed for. Of um, of climate catastrophe, of um, of bioengineering of the of the atmosphere, um, and of the inevitability of environmental terrorism. I think he, along with Edward Abbey, um, is um, we are we're, we're very likely to look back at these people as. Um, prophets as speaking with a prophetic voice. Um, I hope not, but I'm afraid so. But thanks for the question. Great. Uh, I, I have a question for uh, Nance. You had uh, a couple of poems about teaching. Can you talk a little bit about how the teaching has impacted on your own writing of poetry? Yeah, is it a creative symbiotic process for you? Yeah, I think it has been. I mean, I feel like I, I share the same struggle that young beginning poets are always struggling with. Um, and I, I sort of recognize that and just how writers, we have to kind of feel our way through and um, and make the mistakes as part of how you become your own poet, a different poet, mm -hmm. your own original poet is um, how you solve your own issues. Um, you know, I remember Dick Hugo said, if somebody tells you, you know, something in this, um, this, this word in this line is not working, maybe it's the word next to it, or maybe it's the line next to it. You know, that really struck a chord with me because I feel like that's, I'm very aware of that when I'm talking to students about their work that, you know, may, I think maybe I'm talking to them about something they could work on, but maybe it's something aligned with uh, what I'm saying that, you know, it's just so much about discovering your own way as you're, as you're going along and just to kind of um, let them know that that's, that's a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's was my experience. Sometimes I would assign students to turn in uh, some pages of their journal and then attach to it the uh, the finished product or the poem that grew out of it. But then I look at the pages and think, uh, well, that you shouldn't have been writing about that at all. There's nothing else in the. No, <laughs> you never know what's going to come. They're going to come up with. That's great. Uh, any other uh, questions coming up on the line yet, Wendy, or shall we just turn to John? Uh, that's it for the moment. Okay. Um, I'd like you to just talk, John, if you just mentioned a little bit more about the secret agent, actually. When I was in graduate school, that was the first lecture I ever had to write was on the, the secret agent. And, really? You know, and then, of course, there's the, the, the Hitchcock film um, based on the book. And... Uh, and all of those crazy characters in there, Mr. Verloc and Winnie and all those. Anyway, just could you just talk a little bit more about how that sifted into your yeah. into your poem? <laughs> there was, as you could imagine, um, the method here, very unlike anything I've ever written before, right. was to um, assemble everything I could find uh, at the time on Pietro Kaczynski. And, and and already today today that project would be you would be buried you would be inundated there is so much you know, to read at that time there was a great deal um but I, I i was swimming around in it and um and in amongst it um some um biographical details of kaczynski's early life and he mentioned this book or or I think he himself, yes, mentioned that this was a book that he had read dozens of times as a kid. I thought, okay, I'd never heard of it actually. And so I went and read it. And I had a hair raising, the hair raising experience of seeing um, 
extraordinary parallels. I mean, the life that he wound up living and, and, um, and, and the tragedy of his life as it played out with, with this novel. It was almost like uh, life imitating art. Mm. Um, but, I, but I had my doubts and it's interesting as I read it, um, I think the poem is too long. It's still, I'm still reconsidering it. And um, <clears throat> as, as, as uh, taken as I am with all those details about the nail bombs and the potassium permanganate and all of these things, there's a little too much of it. And, um, and I'm thinking that I don't really don't want to include um, uh, that Conrad uh, material. I think I might take it out. Okay. Um, <laughs> we'll okay. see. All yeah, right. Stay, you know, I don't know. It's still changing. Um, thank you. And before we go on to Nance again, Christopher, do you have anything you want to add or ask uh, at this point? <laughs> well, I'm no, I'm, I'm I'm pleased to be on speechlessness. Actually, it's great to hear these two friends writing so beautifully, writing so utterly beautifully. And I and I really like the political force that's in your poem, John. It's really very hard to get into a poem and keep it still a poem. Yeah, thank, thank you. Well, it feels really connected to something deep down in, in John, too. You feel that. Yeah. Yes. That intimacy in the poem. No, they're, they're, you, you have to, you, as you know in your poem about your students, you have to feel empathy. I think that I think I've often thought, in fact, that that when you get to the essence of what poems are and what all art is, it's really empathy. It's really they're all saying, you know, whether a concerto or a or a dance, um, they're saying the artist is saying, "I know how you feel. You're not alone." We feel this together. This is this is an act of empathy, and 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 as as fraught and vexed as it is, I feel this empathy for Theodore Kaczynski. Um, at the same time that I'm revolted and appalled. Um, so, um, so yeah, it's there. There, there's a a, a a connection. I hope to get in touch with him. Uh, I don't know how successful I'll be, but I'm interested in sharing the poem with him. Um, we'll see about that. Great. Yeah. Um, He's not doing much these days, as you can imagine. Not. <laughs> um, Nance, do you see this uh, new collection of yours as a departure from what you've been doing previously at all? I mean, is it, is it breaking what you would call new ground or is it a continuation? Uh, what you and for for um, I, I would say that some of the poems are seem to me a lot more accessible than some of the, your your other work. Uh, I don't know if you've felt that or have any comment on that or. Uh, um, that that could very well be true. The accessibility, um, you know, there are some prose poems in there. There's a, a kind of sequence of. Uh, poems that are about past life and future life experiences. So I think um, those those are sort of uh, felt like they were the putting a, a different mm -hmm. a toe in a different ocean there. Yeah. And, 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 and the humor in it, is that is that typical of some of your other collections uh, are or not? I think so. I, th I think they all. I, th I think of humor as a kind of counterpointing to make the the light makes the dark darker, and the dark makes the light yeah. lighter. And they kind of need each other. I think. Yeah. Uh, I love that idea. You know, creating the, listing all these excuses students come up with. You know, uh, especially at this time of year, because when I taught at Idaho, you know. Uh, 
if you if you had had an emergency on Wednesday before Thanksgiving, then that gave you you know four days altogether. And so we used to keep a poll at, as to who had the most uh, dead relatives that uh, were happening <laughs> in their class and that they had to you know go to the funerals for. And we yeah, but I think we put a more yeah, yeah, yeah. how many dead grandmothers and dead grandfathers there were. Anyway, um, I, I would sometimes say of my students that. Uh, taking this class may be dangerous to your relatives. Yeah, yeah it may be dangerous to your relatives, yeah. yeah. So. yeah. I remember a guy whose grandfather died three times in the same year. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Nance, uh, I, have a, I, I have a sort of a comment question, um, and I'd like you to read a poem. One of my favorite poems in your book is What City, What Day? And... Um, because it captures something Hank was uh, just saying. Um, it occurred to me that, that this poem and a lot of the work toggles between the antic and the dire. And this poem, I think, really captures that. Could you read it? Um, sure, I'll have to actually get the hard copy up. And well, while you're getting that, um... Are there any other questions that are coming up on our YouTube board, or are we? Uh, is that about right it? Right now, we often get questions or accolades later, so I yeah, think it's, right. It's so yeah. frequently after the fact. That's fine. You have a page number, John. I can't. Oh, here it is. Yeah, I worked for quite a while when I was going to college um, in the hospital. I had many hospital jobs. What city, what day? I was pushing the gurney and the, daughter, the doctor walking beside it, kept asking questions of the prone man who stared back at me as if for help on a grade school quiz. Who is our president? What city are we in? Saints stood like stone lions on either side of the elevator doors. Going up, I put one palm over the man's cheek and ear. He'd failed the questions. White heat warmed my hand as the floors blurred by. Then the man touched the doctor's sleeve. Please, he pleaded. I know people are starving, but don't let them eat me. I can find the way. I know the road to the kingdom. Yes, that's lovely. Great. Yeah, that, that image of the um, the lions on either side of the elevator, like saints. That's like a, a great objective correlative. For the, oh, it's really a lovely. It reminds me of, of what was said of uh, Richard Hugo that he was a stand-up tragedian. You know, it's a, a remarkable. Yeah, very good. Uh, we're we're kind of uh, getting toward the end now of our mm -hmm. uh, question and answer. Uh, we're gonna have maybe one more for for each of you, and then uh, uh, we'll move on to some not extensive announcements, but some some that are a little more that we have. Um, so, uh, John, would you say this is a really large departure for you? Uh, in this poem that you read to us uh, in comparison to your other work? Uh, yeah, you know, it is. And one, one of the reasons I wanted to read it is, is um, because of that, because it's, I wanted to get um, closer to it in order to revise it. And, mm -hmm. and um, reading does that, you know, it, um, uh, your voice, really gets to the truth of the poem and whatever flaws and failures um, are right on the surface and you choke on them, yeah. <laughs> you know, when you when they're in your mouth. And yes. so it's very useful that way. And um, yeah, you know, I there is a, a little bit of a precedent, a distant uh, influence, I guess, on this poem. It's um, a marvelous book that nobody has read, but I can recommend it to you. And that is um, Mausoleum by Hans Magnus Enzensberg, the German uh, anarchist, uh, socialist, brilliant poet. Um, and he, um, the book is a collection of short biographies of different um, 
famous, influential people, thinkers, philosophers, and so on. And um, um, so, yeah, it is it is different. It's so exciting. It's exciting to me. Um, All right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Nance, and then I just close by, can you talk a little bit more about the significance of Martha Washington um, as she is in this poem? You know, uh, I grew up with her as a you know mythological figure, but I think you're using her differently than than um, I was projected to me. Well, I sort of grew up with her too, in that I started grade school um, in Mount Vernon, Virginia, and I remember riding the school bus, and all around Mount Vernon, there were little were homes, historic homes, and they had signs in the window. Martha Washington slept here. Martha Washington slept there. <laughs> no, here. <laughs> so I just, I had, that was, it felt like a, I had this connection to her because she was such that I was just learning to read and I could actually read these signs. And my um, great, great, great uncle was the school bus driver. Ah, uh, wonderful. Great. <laughs> Well, thank you all for being here and for a wonderful reading. It's been a great. Thank, thank you. Yes. Thank great. You. And uh, Wendy, one more time with the with the book launch. Could we have the? And uh, and then we're gonna go go into some announcements here, and then we'll come back to you to uh, sign us out. All right. Uh, I just wanted to make uh, just a couple quick announcements. You have it. You have in your uh, comments on the YouTube, the the River Road Reading Series will be uh, live on Zoom, uh, the last Sunday of this month, November twenty eighth, uh, from four thirty to six, and we'll have Edward Moran, Bill Silverly, and Mia Vance, and you can uh, access more information via the website that's listed below. And then uh, it's been our, with great deal of sadness that we have heard that Eric Muller had passed away a couple of weeks ago. And he's someone who has been a major literary force uh, in our region here. And he actually lived in Oregon since 1969, teaching English at community colleges in Coos Bay and Eugene. And he's the founding editor of Fireweed and since 2002, the editor and publisher of Trap Rock Books. Um, there will be a memorial for him on December 22nd at Tsunami Books. And you can get further information. I don't know, Wendy, if we still do have that phone number for them that we can run across the... Yes, and of course, if you want, wish to uh, order other books, um, you can certainly uh, access that number too, but he will be recognized at that time. So um, again, I want to thank everybody for this uh, very interesting reading and uh, wish you all the best of luck in this 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 series, which of course doesn't, I guess, need a lot of wishing of luck because it's been full of luck and good fortune for such a number of years. So thank you. I'll turn it over to Wendy now. Yes, thank you everybody so much. Um, I believe, Henry, if I'm correct, that December is the Windfall Reading Series takes a little break. We have a break and then in, uh, uh, yes, in, in January, uh, we're going to have uh, two uh, wonderful readers. Uh, one of them is Kim Johnson, who has become famous with her This Is My America book. Uh, who is also in the provost office uh, at the University of, of Oregon. And uh, she has actually been on Oprah. And this book is going to be made actually, I believe, into an HBO series. She will be reading. And then also uh, Kelly Osborne will be reading her poetry. And Kelly has been a mainstay of the Lane Literary Guild for a number of years. And um, that is... Uh, going to be in uh, January 18th. 
So that will be our next reading. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, thank you, all of the readers and all of the participants and everybody watching. Um, and have a fantastic rest of the next month and a half. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, all. Good night. Thank you, all. <laughs>